Friday! Happy Friday night, everybody. How do I how do I sound? How does everything sound? We're wearing our Visions in Sound shirt tonight. Rob Daniels Visions in Sound. But how do I actually sound? And how do I get that beard hair off my shirt? How's everybody doing? How do I sound? Chris Sar is already messaging me. Good luck, he says. Thank you, Chris Sar. I believe in the show business, though, it's break a leg is the is the phrase. Uh, do notice that this camera likes to focus funny, but um, maybe I just need to stop moving around so much. I think we will be okay. Pure imagination loves me. Well, that's good. Hello, Candace. How are you tonight? Mr. Harrison Cop is in the house. Chris Sarr says I'm loud. The visions and sound are both good. Okay, well, I'm going to do an unboxing, but uh, before I do the unboxing, I had an idea that I wanted to throw out there, and I'll bring Deke on for this idea. Hey, Deke. Hey, folks. So I had an, I had an idea I want to throw at T-Bone. Sure. And um, I want him to record a couple jingles for me. Because there's periods of the show that are always the same every week. Like there might be a time at the beginning of the show where I'm waiting for a guest. So then I would like to hear like a 30 second jingle. Waiting for the guest. Waiting for the guest. I think he could do that. And then another one would be like when we're about to start counting down the lists. And he can come in with a jingle like counting them down. Counting them down. It's the Nigel. Tough. You know, you know. Yeah, yeah. I, I just think I think I think T Bone would be perfect to record me a couple of jingles that I could use every single week at the same spot in the show. Yeah, I think he would be up for it. He probably already if he's watching this right now, he's probably <laughs> already got his acoustic out. Yeah. He'll he'll have it done by the time the show is over. Uh and yes, Robert <laughs> Oh shit. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, that was a Spinal Tap moment right there. We, we totally jinxed that because we were talking about how awesome the sign was. And yeah, Give me a second here. Okay. Uh, I'll just address Robert Daniel's comment. Yes, it's the it's the depackaging portion of the show. The depackaging portion of the show. His favorite part. He's like Jingle Bells. Yes, you're the man, T-Bone. You are the man. Thunder Bay Arena Rock with the thing. I can yes. I can just be like a kiss. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> as soon as Deke returns, then I will depackage this, which I guarantee you you want to see. Promise. Promise. Looking at these comments, I can never... Some of the YouTube aliases, I can never remember who they are. But hi. I've never seen Chinatown, so I don't know. Deke is returning after suing the, the Scotch Tape Company. No, I was stick-tac. Stick-tac. All right, so we are going to stab this thing with a knife. And we are going to have a look-see what came from the Amazon. And when I say the Amazon, I do not mean the jungle. I mean the retailer. Well, I'm sure you're surprised to see this band return on the LeBrain train. Um, maybe you could read it better that way. Rock and roll Crazy Nights. This is... Um, before Crazy Nights, this is their very first live album called Live Loud Alive, Loudness in Tokyo. It appears to be a um, two-disc set, 13 tracks in total. And this was recorded, I think, just before the Disillusion album. I think they only had three, three albums out in Japan at this time. And I actually have two special knives. Um, they're both Swiss Army knives. But I have two. One for when I lose the other. So yeah, um, based on my track record, you can probably expect a review of this in a couple of weeks. 
There you go. What year is that from again? Sorry. I'm going to say about 83. Whoa, that's really going back. Yeah. Yeah. So, Deke. Mm hmm. Maybe you, you should be the one to tell us who our special guest is tonight. Our special guest is that we're beyond psyched to have uh, the one and only Mike Fraser on, who yep. has basically been a part of our music collection for yeah. years and still continues to be part of our music collection today. Yeah. So I reached out to him last Saturday afternoon, and by <laughs> Saturday night at 10, we had tonight all booked up. I couldn't believe how quick it went. It was like, yeah. okay. And you know what? That's awesome. And Mike was uh, forthcoming with his emails towards me. And then I, of course, sent them to you because you yeah. hooked up all the StreamYard stuff. And uh, yeah. you guys yeah. got it all worked out. And uh, it's going to be a great chat because this guy is, he's like right up there with Bruce Fairburn and Bob Rock and that whole Vancouver thing. And we're going to get into all of it, man, from Loverboy right through to Van Halen to Loverboy to Motley Crue to Rush Lake everything so stay tuned folks you're not going to want to miss this one i what i the way i will per, uh, let's get all the let's get all the the, the <laughs> peanut butter mouth out of the way now uh, the way the way i worded it on my on my site i i kind of exaggerated but i said it in two different ways um 99.999 percent certain that you own something with his name in the credits and yep. the other thing i said was um it's just about guaranteed that he has engineered or mixed one of your favorite albums. Oh yeah, totally. And all of that's true. Hello yeah. to uh, hello to Mr. Mars. Hello to Mr. Kevin. And hello to Mr. T Bone, who's referring to you <laughs> as Balls of Steel. You guys oh, going to talk about that Black and Blue album he did? I'm not sure. Well, he has uh, he has arrived. Shall we bring him on? Yeah, Let's right. do it. Hello! Hey. Hello. Hey. How are you? Hey. All right, man. <laughs> How are you guys? Good. Yeah, we're good, man. Thanks for uh, joining us tonight, oh, Mike. Yeah, this is going to be fun. Yes, it will be. <laughs> well, it's going to be fun. We we got like 40 years worth of stuff we want to ask you tonight. So. Uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> right on. Well, so, thanks for coming on. I, I yeah. You know, uh, Deke and myself, we've been doing this for only a short time uh, since last March, basically, when we went into lockdown. Yeah. Everybody's looking for something to do on a Friday night, and I really appreciate you coming and spending your time with us tonight just to talk about some rock. Oh, yeah, dude, it's great. Hey, this looks great, too. What are you using as a... This is just called StreamYard. I oh. pay a monthly subscription, yeah. and uh, yeah, it was, uh, it's been working for me since about August. This looks great, and the and the audio is great. You know, I've done a few of these on Zoom and other one, and you know, you always get the delays. The oh, we've had we we have that. Don't worry. <laughs> well, that's coming, is it? <laughs> well, last week my camera conked out, and I had to rejoin by tele by by my cell phone. So uh, <laughs> we're knocking wood that my new Logitech camera will work the oh, whole right time on. tonight. Right on. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. That's well, cool. um. Since you showed up early, um, Deke, I, do you think we should run the theme song, or do you think we should skip the theme song and just get right into it? You know, Mike, would you would you be willing to do, listen do to our the, theme song? That do, my do best the theme song. That'd be awesome. This is the right. the I newly can, updated can version. In if you want to. <laughs> <laughs> well, unfortunately, it's a it's an intro video, so your dancing would be lost on the audience. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> this is the uh, the latest version of the Lebrain Train theme song by T Bone Erickson. Uh, featuring uh, new additions to the train. Uh, we got Martin Popoff appearing in the video now and Mike Slayan, who was on last week. So please enjoy the LeBrain Train intro theme song. Uh.
take it to anywhere. And a glazed donut. To go, to go. Rocks. That's <laughs> not bad for something the guy recorded uh, during lockdown just uh, on a whim yeah man <laughs> that's cool yes yeah that was my best friend of uh, well over 40 years who uh, put that together for mike and uh yeah he did a pretty killer job on it all basically off his phone almost yeah. like it's, oh wow huh. yeah hey, it's ridiculous yeah. hey you don't but, need guys uh, like me anymore <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 that, no 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 <laughs> i don't have what? that song stuck in my head now the brain <laughs> <laughs> you know what though like sorry to go off script all of a sudden but i, I do wonder uh, your profession you know are you being replaced by home studios because it seems everybody has one now well, you know what, to a certain extent, I, I guess so. You know, there's a lot of uh, sort of would-be clients I would have had that are now doing it at home. But, you know, it's some of it's out of need and necessity. You know, the, the money's just not there to, to afford, you know, to pay me and a studio. So, you know, more and more people are doing it at home. The, you know, the gear is getting better and yeah. quality is getting better and that. Um, you know, when you want a full professional big you know you know everybody always says oh why does my stuff sound so small compared to yours it's like well you're mixing in a box and it's that you know uh you know i think we all coexist it's it's about expressing your art and however yeah. that art form gets out there i'm down with it you know well that's a that that's good to hear that uh you don't feel threatened but uh <laughs> certainly you're not going to hear uh angus young release a, a bedroom recording done on an iphone not not yet, but you, know, you never say never. <laughs> right, I suppose that's true. Well, sorry to go off script, but I believe Deke wanted to uh, dig into some ancient history. Well, not ancient history, but some history to start with, didn't you, Deke? I'll put on my cap and see yeah. what I can remember. <laughs> well, the way well, back Mike, machine. Yeah. Mike, when we have, Mike, when we have guests on, we actually we actually do our homework here. Oh wow! <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, so. I was thinking as, as the LeBrain train was playing, maybe this week's episode should be, uh, since Mike did Sonic Temple by the cult, it should be the medicine train. Yeah. Oh, right? nice. hey, there we go. Yeah. But uh, anyways, Mike, uh, cheers for you for willing to come on and talk music with us as um, you are a big part of a lot of our collections along with Bob Rock and of course the yeah. late great Bruce Fairburn. Yeah. I yeah. mean, yeah. everything, you know, ninety like Mike said today, Facebook ninety nine point nine percent. You have Mike Fraser in on something along with those two guys. So what we do here is, of course, we're going to drill you with some questions. But <laughs> we've had we've had our previous guests on, and uh, like we had Martin Popoff on, and we did a showed some books of his, and you know we talked about it. We had Greg Fraser from Brighton Rock Storm Force on. We talked about his days in Brighton Rock and touring. And so we like to, you know, show kind of like the props and then we just kind of focus <laughs> in and, and talk a bit. And yep. if you're willing to be game, we'll get yeah. going. I'm here. I got my my trusty <laughs> beer. I mean, water. <laughs> right. <laughs> this is where we do the no. drink sponsors. You know, here we go. Yeah. Soda. <laughs> Soda <laughs> and coffee. And I, I do too. I double fist it. So. It's actually smearing so, off, but uh, no. Right. Well, it's, we got we got to do the rock thing, so right. yeah, sure, it's smearing off. Yeah, it's a little early on the West Coast yet, but uh. yeah. <laughs> and please and please let us know because I mean, me and Mike can easy easily go three hours with you. So if if we start going too long, just as soon as I start do. wheezing and gasping, right? And <laughs> That's the cue. Yeah. Okay, so. For a lot of our viewers out there, they see the name Mike Fraser, and of course, you know, I did some reading, and I've been reading a lot about you and Bruce and, and Bob over the years, but you grew up in Langley. Yeah. And uh, how, just explain to everybody real quick how you went from Langley to Little Mountain Sound, and like what you yeah. did in the training and all that, if you don't mind. Yeah, it was bizarre. Um, 
I started playing guitar in early high school. I uh, met up mm -hmm. with a couple of guys. We, we formed this, this garage band and uh, we had a lot of fun. I mean, we didn't have a singer, so, but it wasn't really instrumental like a Saturani. We just mm -hmm. sort of played the instrumental of the song, but just with no singer. Uh, but, you know, we managed to play a few school dances and everybody mm -hmm. just loved this. It was all covers and, and whatnot. Uh, but mm -hmm. I learned pretty quick, I wasn't going to make any money playing guitar. <laughs> you know, it's just, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's what started my spark. Um, and then, you know, that during that time, you know, God, it was the mid seventies, man. Like, you know, you check out the music that came out then. So I was, that was all my, my breeding ground, you know, like, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the Black Sabbath, I was really into the Black Sabbath stuff and Machine Head, Deep Purple Machine Head came out and, and all these great records. And, you know, I was really drawn into them, you know, listening to the, the crafting of the stuff. Anyways, fast forward a bit. Uh, I quit school in grade nine. Uh, my dad had his own sort of uh, local logging company. So mm -hmm. I went and drove bulldozer and trucks for my dad. And then I drove gravel trucks and some logging trucks after that. And I got tired of being laid off in the winter, you know, when it got all muddy, you know, here on the West Coast it gets muddy. It doesn't, it doesn't <laughs> freeze. Yeah. Um, so you shut down during the winter and, you know, I was making a pretty good wage. Uh, so I could afford to kind of sit around for two or three months, but, you know, I just got sick of, Oh, what's going on? I'm young and restless now. Oh, what's you know? I just got <laughs> not me. I've got to be. Yeah. So I thought I got to reinvent myself. What do I want? Well, I like music, but I can't play it worth shit. So <laughs> hey, maybe I'll get in behind the scenes. Um, mm -hmm. So I thought oh, I'll call up a few studios around town and see if I can get a job at a recording studio. So one of the first ones I called was uh, was Little Mountain, and uh, they were they said that they had no positions open but they needed a janitor so if I was <laughs> to, you know being a janitor you know, come on down so foot in the door bang down i went and foot in the door got that job and i don't remember exactly how long i was a janitor for because it kind of blurred after the first week uh you know i was hanging out with the, the guys that it was little mountain at that time was a primarily a jingle place uh okay. with gibson Owned, owned the business in the in the building and and they uh did you know all the jingles and stuff so i would help out on the jingle so i'd start at i don't know three in the morning doing my janitor stuff then eight or nine i'd sit up for the jingles for that day sit in help help roger monk was the the, the main engineer for all the jingle work helped him you know he taught me tons of stuff you know I was so wet behind the ears I didn't even know what a 57 mic was you know how do I plug this cord into where does this go you know I was just I was super green so it was it was great uh and then we'd work till like five or six and then the studio would shut down we'd all go home and I'd be back there you know three in the morning again in the meantime Bob Rock was working there and he was an assistant there and he'd help on jingles and stuff too well, he started at night coming in, you know, after six, seven o'clock and uh, was recording all the, the local Vancouver punk bands. So, you know, this would have been oh, yeah. 78, 79 ish. Wow. Yeah, um, yeah. So, you know, after like a jingle gig and before I go home, I'd hear this cool music coming out. So I'd poke my head in. Oh, well, you got Oh, cool. I said, hey, Bob, you know, do you mind if I hang out and, and give you a hand? He goes, yeah, man, you know, whatever you're into. So. So then I stayed after and I'd work with Bob till about midnight or so, but then I'd have to be back there again for like four in the morning. So uh, I just brought my sleeping bag and I basically slept in the loading bay for about a year and a half. So I was <laughs> doing jingles and helping Bob at night. Like I was just hooked. I was so into it. Like, you know, it was 20, 22 hour days and two hours sleep, but I didn't care. And I was, God, 18, 19 when I started. So wow. who needs sleep? Who needs sleep? <laughs> you know? Yeah, so that yeah. was sort of the start. And then and then Bob and, and Bruce Fairburn hooked up. And I think one of the first projects they did together was uh was Prism. Mm -hmm. And the album they worked on was was uh Armageddon. So they started doing that. I was still doing my janitor, but I'd jump in and assist. So that was sort of the first record uh I assisted on. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was one of Bob's first, you know, uh, engineering records and, you know, one of Bruce's first sort of production records, too. So the team got born then, I guess. 
So after that, uh, I'm not sure how long after that, it became the Loverboy thing. So Bruce got the Loverboy gate. So they came in there. And so very quickly at Little Mountain, where it was all jingles, it was starting to become more rock. Now, we were only allowed to come in after five, uh, after the jingles were done. But because we're getting more of these bigger budget bands coming in, you know, the Loverboy had a big push behind them. Uh, you know, we started kind of demanding, hey, we need more than, than evenings and weekends to do this. So you could block out a day time. So we started blocking out the studio time. Now, fortunately, there was two studios in Little Mountain. So the jingle sort of moved over to the other studio. Um, but uh, I know there's a lot of rubs during those years where, you know, we were set up and had everything set up and they'd come and they need to do a jingle and <laughs> we own this place. And uh, like, well, you know, we're doing this. Yeah. And, so that's yeah. that's kind of how it all started. Then you know, me, Bruce, and Bob were were kind of the team, and then it all just started avalanching after that. Well, you know, it's funny you should mention the avalanching, because growing up when I was into rock, getting into rock in the mid '80s, I seem to remember hearing a lot about Little Mountain and bo names like Bob Rock and Bruce Fairburn, yeah. and I would see names like Mike Fraser in in CD credits, and I think a lot of the awareness. Uh, in Canada came from much music. Those guys were constantly talking about Little Mountain and Bob Rock. Cause they, you guys were doing some pretty big records. I remember the excitement when uh, the news came out that Bob was going to be doing the new Cult album in 89, you know? And what is Bob going to... You know, he already did Kingdom Come and kind of gave them a Zeppelin-y twist. What is he going to do with the Cult, you know? Yeah. And I just remember... there's. It, I can remember summers where I'm like, you know, Aerosmith, they're in Vancouver right now, you know? Like, yeah. there's so much excitement in Canada around that place. It was a, a very special place. Well, it's funny. Right around that time, you know, I think it was... I can't remember it was Aerosmith and Motley Crue in there or whatever, but anyways, we had we had groupies that surrounded the building <laughs> like, for 24 hours a day. You know, you'd park your car and you'd have to wade through you know, literally two or three deep to get through the front door. And, and they were all cool, you know, they were just hanging out. And then they got to the point where they got got their timing down where they knew the, when the band came in, they knew when dinner break was, and they knew when the band left. So they during the day, they sort of disperse and then you know at dinner time holy smokes how are we going to get out of here and, i mean it was a great time and, and a funny story right around that time too uh the vice squad was really cracking down on hookers downtown <laughs> the streets downtown that were just mayhem of hookers so they i don't know if they changed the file out whatever they they shoved them out of the downtown area well they all ended up out in the little mountain area which is a little bit <laughs> outside of town so you get all these groupies around the studio on every street corner there's at least two or three hookers um i was assisting at that time so i remember coming back from a uh, a food run you know gone to get some you know curry or something for the guys and so come down the street pull a u-turn at the four-way stop and park in front of the studio well psh, cop lights go off and get me out of the car and like oh i'm just delivering the food you know i gotta get no no you know license registration you know all this crap food wow. on the top. And so they thought i was there checking out the hookers right so right. <laughs> it's gonna get 20 minutes to get that all settled down i said dude let me just get the food into the guys while it's hot and i'll come back and <laughs> 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 oh man Oh man that's hilarious but you you say that like uh they knew the time of when the bands uh, would go for dinner and stuff. And I think from what I read with like, especially with Bruce Fairbairn, he ran the tight ship of you show up at this time and I have my family and da, 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 da. And I think, you know, you have to, that's a lot of respect. The artists and the band showed a guy like Bruce Fairbairn is they all bought into the, I don't know if it was nine to five hours you're working, but everything was regimented and yeah. look at the success and yeah. formula and everybody going to Vancouver. And I'm sure Bob probably worked like that as well. Yeah. yeah. Like, cause you know, Bruce, you know, Bruce was a real stickler for that kind of stuff though. Like, you know, mm -hmm. uh, I seem to remember, you know, we wouldn't start any earlier than say noon or one because you know, the, just the bands after years of being on the road and yeah, the game, of course. you can't get anybody in earlier than that. You know, that's changed over the years, but uh, that time I think it was, you know, noon or one. And so Bruce was cool that, you know, if we had anything to sort of pre-do, you know, we'd start maybe 11 or something like that. But usually it was noon, we'd start. And uh, 
and Bruce would come in and he'd have his list of what he wanted done that day. Okay, today we're working on this song. Uh, we're going to do guitar overdubs. And then at this time, we're going to do that. And he was fairly flexible, but that's what he wanted to get done. So, for example, if the guy was, you know, playing solos and we'd, if we'd do a couple of takes of solos and he wasn't really inspired, wasn't really there, Bruce would say, look, he says, go home and, and go back to the hotel or whatever, work on your solo. We'll do this tomorrow or another time. Mm -hmm. We're going to get up and do this. Like he was... You know, he was all up for creativity in the studio, but that cost studio time. And, he, you know, Bruce is one that no matter what, he always came in on or under budget. And that was that was big back there in the 80s. Yeah, you know, the yeah were for sure. 300,000 plus. So that's like, you know, you're talking big bucks. So, you know, there can't be a lot of fooling around time. And then, you know, Bruce would go home every night at 530 or 6. You know, he... And he also coached the son's soccer team. So sometimes he'd disappear for that. And, you know, he'd leave me and Bob or whatever to do. Hey, can you guys record the, the solo? Can you do, you know, we'd mm -hmm. do stuff. We'd have a little dinner break too. But, you know, I lived in Langley, so I wasn't going to drive an hour home for dinner. <laughs> and so, yeah, yeah. so, you know, we'd have dinner. We'd go out or whatever. And, you know, through a lot of that, you know, the bands wanted to go to the strip clubs. <laughs> but, you know. So we'd have our dinner, but, you know, we'd carry on. And then Bruce would come back, I don't know, seven-ish. And then we'd work till, you know, Bruce would work till 10 or 11. Sometimes Bob and I stayed a little bit later. But he'd like to run a, a really defined, this is what we're doing now. This is what we're going to focus on, you know. And, uh, you know, in later life, you know, when I kind of produce records i try and keep that in mind but i just can't do it like bruce does yeah <laughs> i mean you can you can really see it in um the making of the pump video that's yeah. right. anybody can anybody can watch that now it's actually on i watched all nine parts on youtube this week Ooh. where you get I to see yeah because uh, i've only seen clips i've never watched the whole really thing. Oh, I man, ordered that from Columbia gotta, House back uh, when it was on VHS. Was. <laughs> yeah, and you know what? And you can you can get that feeling. Um, there, I'll never forget the the one scene in it where um, you're sitting uh, mixing, and behind you is Steve Tyler on his Korg piano, and sitting on the couch is Joe Perry behind you, man. It's like <laughs> it's just like you turn around and it's like what? Really? No, no, it's constantly like. Don't you guys have somewhere to be? <laughs> <laughs> you know, and and it's so great. I mean, there's even that one part in the video where Bruce tells Steve Tyler to leave the studio to go work on his lyrics. And uh, you're sitting in there in the mix with the rest of the guys, and the rest of the guys in the band are saying nothing. <laughs> and even Bruce, I, I cranked up the audio on it. He even said at one point, he goes, was I a little too harsh on Steven? And somebody said, <laughs> and Aerosmith said, that's the problem. Nobody is harsh with him. And then Bruce is like, mm, okay. But you know what? It's a, it's a fascinating documentary yeah. of, of how an album's put together from the demos, the starting stage to yeah. the demos, to the recording, and all the footage of Little Mountain Sound. I mean, that stuff is gold, especially for... Uh, geeks like us that just like yeah. watching that how an album's actually made. Yeah. I used to yeah. fantasize so that, about that being was, at Little yeah, Mountain. Of, of all the records I've done, that was kind of the only one that was documented the whole way. And you know, they came in and and back in those days too, you know, it's like the lights went on, the cameras came out. Like you mm -hmm. know, you didn't have all these low light cameras that we do today. Yeah. So, you know, I remember the first week, you know, we started doing, you know, we'd already had done the permanent vacation record. So we, you know, the same team had already, mm -hmm. been, but I remember the first week it was really, you know, I think it cheesed Bruce off a bit because it sort of dampens, you know, as soon as the lights come on, the camera's on, everybody changes a little bit. But it was every day, constant 24 hours or whatever we're in there. It was just always on. So you started forgetting about it. It started to do the mm -hmm. thing. And that's why, like, I know a lot of stuff was edited out. But, you know, that's why you get all more of these honest and actually a real look at how a record's done. Because the cameras were always rolling. They were always on. You know? Yeah, and that's the thing. You you watch the making of the pump video. You guys aren't even looking at the camera. No. Like you guys are focused on the task at hand. It's not like you're saying something and then looking at the camera. Like you Take guys up. are like, Take up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like that's 
it's like it's almost like us as fans are almost there watching it yeah, being yeah. done and that's probably the best thing i can really say about it other than it's real cool to see like i just can't imagine how loud joe perry was in the studio playing <laughs> some of those songs like young lust and stuff it's just like what a mind blower so yeah. well you know and it's funny too because over the years and and all those great records we've, we've done and that um there's hardly any pictures because we're all just there doing our tasks. Like mm -hmm. it wasn't about, oh, yeah. I gotta get a picture with Joe Perry. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Nobody does yeah. that if they're doing our job. Um, I used to go in there, I, I had bought, you know, started having kids, so we had bought kind of a good camera. And I thought, so I brought my camera in. I've got a shitload of pictures of drum setups, but <laughs> I, never, I never labeled them, so I have no idea now <laughs> what they were. <laughs> oh, look at that drum kit. But none of me, none of the bands or whatever. So, mm -hmm. you know, there's a guy that uh, worked there, another engineer and, and one of the technical guys, Ron Obvious. So he, Ron is a really good camera buff. So he's, you know, if you look at any of the sort of the Little Mountain Facebook sites or, or websites, or whatever, a lot of those pictures were from Ron. It's like, thank God he took some of those. Like, I think even yeah. on, on my Facebook page, you know, the, the picture of Studio A and all that, that was Ron mm -hmm. put that. Well, thank God he did. Thank yeah. God for Pump because it documented some of that where we never bothered. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, you're there to do a job exactly. So yeah, you know. and you know the, a lot of the artists don't want to be bothered with you know people taking no. pictures and cameras no. and you know of course not here to create you know so it's really interesting with that Pump thing like I say that you know the cameras all of a sudden became invisible even though it's like the bright spotlights on you. Yeah. Um, yeah. And not like the phone things where you can do your little secret. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, no kidding. Yeah. Damn, I know for cool. me, that video, it, it kind of shattered some illusions for me. Like, wow, a, a studio, it's it's work. They're working, <laughs> you know, and the producer's like almost like their boss. And, yeah. and you know, there, there's creative friction. And it's like Joe Perry and Steven Tyler aren't like constantly hugging each other and telling and how much they do. And <laughs> yeah, it's like, but but on the other hand, it also showed some really loose, fun stuff. Like I remember there was one bit where Steven Tyler took his hair and put it up in a top knot and just started like scatting. And it's like, this is the kind of stuff that the rock fans, we, we salivate to see. Yeah, you know, yeah, and me too. Looking back when I can see that stuff, it brings back a lot of great memories. You know, oh, do you mind awesome. if I uh, switch gears a little bit away from the rock? Sure. Because I saw your name on a credit on like I I used Wikipedia and I saw your name on a credit here, and uh, it's not an album I own, but uh, my mother is my most regular watcher, and she wanted me to ask you about the Rankin family. Oh, um, yeah. And I don't know if you engineered or mixed on the Rankin family, but. Yes. Um, I'm just kind of curious what that's like doing more of a vocal kind of uh, group rather than a rock group. You know what? I'd love it because, you know, I was brought up and you sort of get pegged into a certain genre and it's all rock, rock, rock. I mean, mm -hmm. I love every facet of music. And, you know, to be honest, uh, when I'm not in the studio working, I don't listen to rock. I yeah. Don't, I, I don't have a stereo here at the house. I in my car like i've got the hour drive to town an hour drive home i'm trying to find talk radio station like i don't listen to me because yeah, it's, yeah. it sounds like work to me but i will say that i'm a huge fan of say americana uh bluegrass um yeah you know all that kind of older like real heart gut-wrenching stuff and not like hey let's be top of the pops kind of stuff so yeah. I'm, I'm totally into that so the Rankin family is like a is such a big Canadian iconic thing yeah. um, so when I had a chance to work with with them and um, it, you know uh, I jumped at it for sure and it was a bit of a different thing for sure because they uh, her and her producer look for different things in a mix that you know as a rock guy you sort of go one way and they say oh this sounds great everything's big and aggressive but can we tone the drums down a bit can the vocal be a little more loud you know so there's a bit of a learning curve mm -hmm. for me too so it's always awesome to do that stuff that pushes you and that stuff pushed me but i, I just i loved it so you know i did a, a nora jones song too for a yeah 
Uh, it was the greatest hits thing or something or some package. It was just a one-off song. That was awesome too. You know, it's just yeah, stuff that's awesome. out of my my wheelhouse and mm -hmm. can push you a bit is awesome. That, that's oh, that's cool. Really nice to hear. Yeah. And my mother thanks you for answering the question. Oh, sure. <laughs> <laughs> Over to you, Deke. <laughs> thanks for asking, Mom. <laughs> Okay, Mike, so here we go. I'm gonna show you some of my records here with your name in the credits. And uh, if we could maybe just talk a little bit about them. So my first entry point into the Bruce Fairburn, Bob Rock, Mike Fraser was in 1984 with this record. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. That's so I, was, I bought the previous two Crocus albums and then I read in Circus or something that Crocus is recording their new album in Vancouver. I'm like, what? Don't bands <laughs> just go to LA, New York, and London? Like, what's Vancouver? So, of course, I bought it. And uh, any special memories about recording Crocus? This album did quite well for them, actually. Yeah, though, uh, I just remember the, and not to be confused with the Canadian, there was a Canadian Crocus, too, right? A really good friend of mine, uh, Mark LaFont, no was a drummer in that band. But so there's a Canadian Crocus and a, I believe they're they're posted as a, a Swiss band, right? Yeah, yeah, or something. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, no, they all came to town. Um, you know, uh, there wasn't a lot. I guess it was, but I remember it was like really interesting that it was a out of country band came to mm -hmm. Vancouver. Like it was really yeah. kind of neat. You know, uh, I think some of the wives were German and and spoke very little English, and you know, it was just. One of those things that was felt quite exotic or whatever. Um, mm -hmm. But I remember them being all really cool. The, the, the different thing we did on that record, though, because of the times, it was in the 80s, is everything was trapped to a drum machine. Ah. So all the songs were played on a drum machine. So it was exact timing. You know, the Germans and all that, like everything to be very exact. And it's got to be exact. So we tracked everything to a drum machine. When we're done with that, the drummer went out so that he could be inspired by uh, the full vocals, everything, and then play his tracks. And then I remember that took a bit of doing because drummers aren't always that exact. So, you know, he'd be playing along and then all of a sudden things are starting to flam. So it was just, I remember thinking, wow, you know, it, it was really neat that you could dial in the drum sounds to what everything else was instead of, the other way around, you get your drum sounds and then you try and fit everything to the drum sound. It was sort of done the backwards way, but, um, you know, it was it was kind of cool. I remember it being really interesting. Uh, I was assisting at that point. And then at, okay. at one point, uh, I don't know, it was Bruce or management or label said, hey, well, we, you know, we need sort of another song on this. We need sort of the lead off thing. They decided to do a cover of the Blitz. Yeah. Well, they were in the middle of doing something. They said, hey, Mike, go over to Studio B with the guys and let's, you know, just record a quick, you know, sort of demo version of it and we can send to the label or whatever. So I went over there and, and recorded the Blitz. So that was sort of my first kind of on my own recording thing. And they ended up using it for the record. You know, they overdubbed on it and that, but, you know, are you ready, Mick? Are you ready? <laughs> it's like, it was fun. <laughs> That's yeah, that's cool. what it. That's what it says in the credits. It says Ballroom Blitz was recorded live on the first take in Vancouver, BC, June eighth, nineteen eighty four, at nine thirty p.m. <laughs> there you go. I remember that it was at night. Eighty four. Yeah. Oh, okay. There you go. <laughs> now, who would have written that information down? Eh, that somebody's yeah. got to write down. It was at nine thirty at night for the liner notes. You know? I know. Yeah, Wouldn't that be great? <laughs> yeah. So you know that me and guys like me and Mike, we're scouring every piece of info that we could find on these records so yeah you know, so I that, feel for you guys like today uh i had to uh, you know for my website i had to sort of update my discography or whatever so go over to whatever thing i got for it i'm going through it. like holy crap dudes like there's like 10 pages or 12 pages i'm like how am i gonna update all this stuff <laughs> <laughs> Hire an intern. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I got I one. I can afford it right now. <laughs> I got one here from your discography that not a lot of people talk about. Oh, dude, they were awesome, eh? Yes, I, I, you you mixed this one. Yeah, smashing yeah. job, smashing yeah. job on the Stone Gods. Yeah, 
So Dan Hawkins, him and his brother Justin, uh, are uh, uh, what's that? Bad show? Well, the darkness. The dark. You know? right? Yeah. So they had, you know, on a high hiatus or you know, stop yeah. doing their thing. I forget how I got that gig, but anyways, you know, Dan and I hooked up, uh, and we. Uh, he says, "Oh, I got this record. Let me say to you the demos." I'm like, "Dude, this is fucking awesome." <laughs> So yeah. missed it, and I tell you, the guitar tones and the drums and like the song, people that don't know that record, yeah, want to check it out. Yeah, holy crap, it is awesome. So we did that record. Um, I think it did okay. It didn't like you know blow up, which kind of surprised me. And then in the meantime, uh, Justin and Dan sort of made up differences and reformed yeah. Garbage again. So that was you know, the end of the film. Golf. The singer. Of yeah. funny enough, I think was a roadie for the darkness. He was the bass tech originally, yeah. and then he uh, took over on bass for Frankie Poulain when he okay. departed for the second yeah. album. And then yeah. got promoted to lead singer, and I remember being really skeptical, like, "Oh my god, a, a band is promoting what a, a bass bassist!" Play? Yeah, he's like a oh, Halford. Shit. How about that song? Where Where Oh My Bureau? It's like, yeah, the closer. Oh, yeah, man, I still I still get. Goosebumps on that. Yeah. that. I yeah. just realized that the reflection of the CD, you can see the sign behind me says Fart Zone. So <laughs> I, I apologize for ruining the show. Um, <laughs> it, Deke, that's your cue to take it away since I've just ruined the show. <laughs> okay, Mike, we got another album, a big album that came out at the back end of 1984 that you were an engineer on, and that's. Ah, yes. Ah, yes. Reckless. Brian Adams. Now, yeah. that album was mega. So, Keith Scott, that, that was one killer band he has, I tell you. Like, oof. I Great mean, guitar tone. Oh, I know. Yeah. And Curry on drums and Tommy on, on keyboards. And, like, yeah, it was mega. Um, you know, actually, I, I only assisted on that record. Uh, mm -hmm. There might have been a few little bits I did, but... What that record did bring was it brought um, Bob Clear Mountain. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Freaking awesome. Like, he's one of my idols. And him and Hugh Padgham and, you know, Bob Rock were sort of my main idol. Like, I want to be these guys. So mm -hmm. uh, to have Bob Clear Mountain come to Vancouver and sit and record these things was, was a dream come true. So I was put on an assistant on that and uh, kind of became Bob's sort of right hand guy and and just watching how he did things was just you know amazing. Um, I even had the opportunity to go to New York when they were mixing that mm -hmm. record. So I, you know, went to New York and, and hung out. Me and Keith uh, actually shared a hotel room. <laughs> I remember Nice. Yeah. They, they had the their their phone books were, you know, like that <laughs> big, like huge. And we'd, we'd wake up in the morning with these cockroaches on the ceiling. So we'd be trying to throw these phone books up and kill the cockroaches. And it was like a, you know, mid-range, decent hotel. It was like a shithole. It was just... Wow. There was a lot of great times we had there making that record. But, you know, just watching Bob Clear Mountain and his magic, just weave his magic. And he's such a, a soft-hearted, nice guy and just able to steer things in a, in a nice way. Uh, I learned a lot off Bob and, you know, a great set of ears. Well, that's the thing. You you hear the songs, like actually all the stuff like from Reckless, even the, the records that you've done with Bruce and Bob, even when they're like they're playing on our local radio all the time, they still sound great. Like yeah. the songs themselves, the sonics yeah. are there. It's not like, whoa, that sounds like it's from 1980. No, right. it sounds like it could have been done this week. Like the... Yeah. The sound is just so unbelievable. So, well, you know what? Interesting. Um, you know, Bob Clear Mountain got his start doing jingles too. Right? Wow. So, yeah. the thing with doing jingles is you've got, you know, basically five hours to get a song together and mixed and done. And then it goes over to the, the post guys to do voiceovers over it and all that kind of stuff. So you don't, when you arrive in the morning, you, you don't really know what genre. It could be a country tune. It could be this, could be that. So you got to be ready for it. Oh, gee, we got a full orchestra today. Okay. So you got to learn to get your sounds quickly, fast, so that 
they can do their thing and they're not waiting on you. So that was sort of Bob's vibe. That was always our vibe at Little Mountain. Like, you know, just be on it, you know, just ready for everything and on it. Uh, so, you know, working with Bob, you know, that was a lot of his thing. You know, you, you don't spend a lot of time, you, you know, if you got to spend a lot of time on something, something's not right. You know, the drums aren't tuned right or something mm. needs to be changed. You should not have to reach for EQ compression to make that sound happen. The only time you reach for that is like, you got a great sound. Can we make it a little bit better? You know, and that's the only time you keep. So that's what I try and uh, take from all these great guys that I uh, had a, a, such a, you know, uh, it's opportunity awesome. to work with, you know? Yeah, 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 for sure. Mm -hmm. um, and another album I got here is a Canadian one that the team was working on and yeah oh, geez. Oh, yeah <laughs> yeah that was yeah, that's another big record yeah that's that a, is yeah that is a that was a huge I put them right into the arenas in, in uh, Canada <laughs> yeah they were great. I mean they were awesome guys to work yeah. with like, fun and awesome like you know occasionally you get bands in with it's got a bit of a chip on their shoulder or whatever and usually it's the the younger guy I don't know, I've never met a Canadian band that had a chip on the shoulder they were always super super nice guys and that was that was a fun record actually there you go go Canada yeah <laughs> go, go Canada so Mikey do you want to well you know I'm getting so many great comments on the side and I, I can't put them all on but there's one here in particular that sounds really interesting it's from Richard of uh, focus on metal podcast Ask Mike the story when Jimmy Page and David Coverdale got locked out of Little Mountain when they were making the Coverdale Page album and all their equipment was still in there. That uh, sounds funny. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, at the time when we were doing the Coverdale Page record, I, you know, I believe that was the last record I, I did at, at Little Mountain. Um, it was going under uh, some ownership changes. Ah. So... I don't know the whole story, but I know we, we arrived one morning, come in there to go to work, and there's a big chain on the on the front door. Jimmy and David are standing out front in the, in the chain, and there's a sheriff standing there going, nobody. Yeah. <laughs> like, oh, my God. <laughs> like, you know, so, you know, Jimmy and David are saying, hey, look, those are our tapes. That's our music. All those instruments are ours. You can't re repossessing everything, right? Wow. You can't do that. So I think by the end of the day, it got sorted out. Uh, I don't really remember what we did in the meantime. Uh, obviously, I wasn't going to go home. But uh, yeah. you know, I just remember c coming there and seeing Jimmy and David's face. They just look at me going, Mike, what the fuck? And I see this giant <laughs> chain on the door. <laughs> this wow. Shit. And they're going uh i don't know uh let me make a few calls but you know that was before cell phone so to make a few calls you have to go find a phone <laughs> and then find somebody to call so mm -hmm. it was bizarre um you know it did get sorted out that day and you know we carried on but uh, yeah of all records to to do that to you know no jimmy kidding. page let's keep jimmy page outside sorry you can't come in sir <laughs> <laughs> you know that's that's yeah, that, that's the thing I wanted to ask you, Mike, since we kind of jumped ahead to the uh, Coverdale Page record is, yeah. how long did it take for you to wrap around your head when you started working with Jimmy Page in the studio and maybe perhaps kind of telling him maybe that guitar we could kind of do over again without it, <laughs> you know, being take, separating the fanboy from being professional. Oh, he, he probably dude. understood you had a job to do, but. Yeah, dude, I'm still trying to wrap my head around <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I, I tell you, you know, from the first day coming in there, uh, you know, it was like one of the first things, like I'm an engineer. I'm not producer per se. I don't write songs. I don't play instruments, you know, whatever. I'm a, I'm an engineer. So to, so to come in there and co-produce something with Jimmy Page, I'm like, you know, dude, what the fuck? And, you know, he's an, yeah. he's an awesome guy. And I uh, yeah. love Jimmy to death, but you know sit there and they'd be out there playing or whatever and i'm like uh hey jimmy you know the talk about uh jimmy yeah I think you can a little bit better <laughs> and as i'm saying it's echoing in my head if you're actually saying that to jimmy page that made all those lead <laughs> yeah yeah totally i've got a great story like um 
like that record took us a year and two or three months to make we just it was just a long record and i think we're we're at little mountain for four or six weeks just tracking the the, the basic tracks and then we moved down to miami because both jimmy and david lived down there at that time and uh, you know let's go finish the record there so because they lived there they just wanted to just do it easy peasy so we work five days a week monday to friday we start at noon and if we're there at five at night that was a late day so <laughs> basically four or five hours a day and then weekends off and and everybody loved it all the crew and the techs and everything loved it i'm not a sunshine on the beach guy <laughs> i hated it down yeah, like Miami's great, but this is before South Beach, you know, took off as the South Beach it is today. But so we're all staying in South Beach, and so what it was was like, you know, just all the, um, you know, uh, what do they call it? university crowd and all the things. There's all these, you know, giant shots. So I go, I was nighttime crawler. I'd be down there at the bar all night. Strip bars, strip bars never shut. So I'd be at the strip bar till like six in the morning. Come back to the hotel at seven, get a quick nap, go back to the studio at one, super hungover, get through the day till five, go back, sleep for a couple hours, 10 o'clock. All right, where are we going tonight? <laughs> yeah. um, but you know, we're in Miami for like nine months. So I remember one wow. day we go in and, and each day we sort of pick what are we what are we working on? So you know, we'd either work on vocals or guitars mm -hmm. or whatever. And we never sort of, you know, because sometimes David wouldn't come in or Jimmy wouldn't come in. You know, we sort of split it up. So I remember spending all day working on a bunch of acoustic guitars. And we had we recorded all these guitar tracks. And let's try this. And a lot of experimentation and try that. And at the end of the day at, you know, 4.30, <laughs> we'd listen to these things. And Jimmy goes, okay, well, it's just let's revisit it in the morning. Let's come back tomorrow and check it out. So I'm like, okay. So he takes off. So I'm listening to it. I'm like, ah, they're kind of all over the place and they're a bit messy. And, you know, this was again before Pro Tools. So it was all on mm -hmm. tape. But at that time, digital was, was out. So you could, we had these two track digital machines where you could lock it up to the tape and then transfer, to, you know, two tracks to your thing or whatever and lock it back. So with offsets and everything, I, I re-flew all the acoustic guitars so they're all kind of more together and made a thing. I'm like, oh, that sounds cool. So Jimmy comes in in the morning. Hey, let's listen to what we did yesterday. So, oh, okay, cool. So I played it to him and he's going, what happened to the acoustic guitar? <laughs> uh oh well, you know, I'm just kind of moving around, tightening up a bit or whatever. He goes, well, put them back. <laughs> so we did and that was such a huge lesson to me like it's not always about timing and tuning and it, 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 it's about the vibe you know and mm -hmm. that was one thing so now with that you know in my mind you listen back to a lot of the zeppelin and a lot of jimmy's playing where you know you think young know, a bit sloppy but that's how he, it is and that's that's the vibe of it you know like if it was all done perfect and all right it wouldn't have been led zeppelin it wouldn't have been like you know so that was a great lesson for me i've never i never got whipped down so hard for something in my life <laughs> not, and it, it stuck, you know but that's that's um you know it's such a great record and you know yeah. i know has there been any talk about uh reissuing it uh, have you heard? I mean, I don't know if you could spill any beans if there was, no, but no, I haven't heard. You know, anything. like now, that one, I, was, that I one have. was really unfortunate because you know, uh, after all that time, like you know, we did it in Vancouver, did the nine months in Miami at uh, Criteria, which was you know a big famous you know rock mm -hmm. place, and then we went and we what were we three or four weeks at Abbey Road mixing it. So wow. Like, Holy jeez! Like, 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 yeah, it was, yeah. Awesome. it was perfect. Well, yeah. I got a great Abbey Road story for you after, during that after this, but but you know it was all perfect. You know, like Jimmy Page, David Coverdale, great voice. Jimmy, you know, yeah. great producer, very sort of Zeppelin esque type yeah. music, whatever. Uh, Geffen Records, which was huge at that point, we thought, wow, this is this is a no brainer. This is hit it out of the park. 
But when it came out, there was some touring issues. I'm not yeah. sure because you know when I'm done the record, I don't know yeah. all the politics after. There's some touring issues. There's this and that. Um, I know when it was first released, it broke all records of how many stations added in one day or one week or whatever. Mm -hmm. but like, you know, it looked like this is going to be a huge record, and then it just went yeah. and disappeared. But everybody I know that has listened to it is like, why wasn't this record bigger? I don't know. You know, same with the, not to change gear, but same with the Blue Murder record. Like, you know. Yeah. What, Whoa, yeah. What, That's what one that happened? you want to I don't know what happened. <laughs> but I know it was something to do with touring and couldn't do this, couldn't do that, didn't want to do this, didn't. Uh, it's just unfortunate. It has to be disappointing for you, for you personally when you see an album like Coverdale Page that you sunk, what did you say, like 14 months into, and then it just kind of, you know, real strong start and then just steady. Yeah. But that was 1993 for you. I mean, yeah. I was very active in keeping track of the charts back in 93. Well, and, and, and some of that too, like there's so many great bands I worked with right up and at that point. And, you know, say what you will about grunge, it just pulled a plug on everything. Yeah. Everything just oh, yeah. lost. Yeah. See you later. And I would say, you know, 95% of that, like, phew, bye. <laughs> but yeah, yeah. Some great stuff that got, got flushed too. So, unfortunately, you know, yeah. I, I got to ask a question on behalf of our buddy Brian. He, he, again, they're getting so many great comments on the side here, but Brian's asking about a band that he loves called The Wild. So how did, uh, <laughs> or, or as they refer to themselves as those goddamn wild boys. God damn so wild boys. For, for Brian, he's asking how that got hooked up. God, you know, um, I don't remember how Dylan and I, you know. Uh, Dylan Villain. Dylan Villain. Dylan the Villain, we yeah. got hooked up, but, you know, we're family now. Like, him and I are like. Oh, like that's cool. Brothers, or you know, I guess I'm kind of like dad to him. Oh, that's so cool. <laughs> well, younger than me, but you know, we're like brothers. That whole band's like brothers. I've done, you know, I don't know, two, an EP and two records, maybe three records. Like everything we do, we do together. We're like a pack. They are an awesome band. Uh, they got royally screwed with this COVID thing. We had just oh. finished the record uh, last January. They had a full European tour book, like a whole oh, year book in Europe. Yeah. The record just came out, and then March happened, and everything got canceled, and it was just a freaking disaster because we worked so hard to get it to that point. And, you know, North America is a weird market, especially for rock. You know, a lot of rock radio is disappearing, and, you know, everybody's kind of going to where – where the sponsors want you to go, you know, so it, yeah. it's, a, it's a weird market, but Europe is still, the fans are a hundred percent into the, the music and the quality of the music. They're not told what to like. And the wild was blowing the fuck up out there. And so oh, man. We, we said, let's do a record for them. They, you know, they've been over there a few times touring uh, on some uh, backup tours, but on, a few things on their own great headway this last record was just gonna like seal it and it just got shut down but you know <clears throat> if you guys don't know about the wild go oh yeah we search them out. you know you gotta yeah. put a little exclamation or you get that weird movie called the Wild. right but everybody <laughs> uh, yeah go check out the band because they're the real deal and i tell you what you know we try our hardest but you know you can't beat their live show you go and see them live and they are the real deal like i Reckon they're fucking awesome. So yeah, that's cool. Wild man, a, a that's band cool. that's uh, compared sonically at least uh, to ACDC a little bit. Um, yeah. Mike, how are you doing for time? Because uh, we didn't want to leave you without asking an ACDC question, sure. but we also don't want to rush into those questions hey, you if you have what? time. Uh, I'm totally cool. <laughs> nice. All right. Well, well All right. we won't rush. We won't rush into the. We won't rush. <laughs> hey, maybe, maybe I segued into something there, Deke, when I said we won't rush into the ACDC oh, questions. Maybe I you like can segue into that. another. Sure another album sure well we'll we'll get to rush later mikey <laughs> well there goes my segue okay, don't rush us <laughs> yeah my, all that work wanna, into that segue why I do wanna, i bother i know when you were talking uh, a few minutes ago about the cover uh page album yeah and then you mentioned uh blue mirror i'd like to talk about this album that led into 
working with John Sykes and yeah. Bob Rock on yeah. what is a real great record, which just like what happened there. But John Sykes, man, like that guy on that 87 record and the first Blue mm -hmm. Murder, when I hear his guitar on it, that to me is just firepower. Like it's huge. It's oh huge. man. Right. You guys you guys dialed it in so good. I mean, wow. Well, yeah. you know, I gotta tell you on that record, you know, uh it was the late great Mike Stone. Mike Stone was uh a huge part of my career. Uh you know, he had worked on a lot of the um uh, the queen stuff right so that he had done a lot of the queen stuff. he actually told me you know bohemian rhapsody was was recorded in three parts and when they mixed it they only mixed two parts and they said oh yeah that's good <laughs> but i've never heard a rumor or seen or heard anything where's the third part to that i mean that would be great but anyway so mike was was a, an english engineer came out and was doing the white snake record mm -hmm. um we did all the tracking at Little Mountain, came out to Little Mountain. So I was the assistant, but I ended up right. sort of being the engineer because Mike was the engineer producer. But, you know, in England, uh, all their assistants were tape ops. So because we we're on two inch tape, I would run the two inch tape. But everything on that record was punched in. Like if the drums screwed up, they'd stop. We'd rewind the tape, play along, and then we'd punch in. So I, I really learned quickly how to, how to, punch in because you know when you punch in you leave these little gaps coming in and out and you can hear them so there's a way of doing it so you don't hear the gaps and mm -hmm. i got really good at that so so then mike and i became this team so we did this whole record uh david came in to sing and then you know i don't know it's the the humidity or whatever in right mm -hmm. and he got a, a bad infection whatever he couldn't couldn't sing so he went away I think he ended up in uh, Miami or, you know, down south. Uh, then weeks later, whatever. Anyways, we sent them all the tapes to to put the singing on. I don't know the politics behind it, but <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, we know what happened. Yeah. A lot of guitars got erased so that because it's on tape, so you only have a certain amount of tracks. So a lot of guitars got erased for David to sing on. And then he sent the tapes back and said, OK, uh, you need to replace your guitar solos and <laughs> John and Mike are just like, oh, girl. So I know some of the guitars or one solo got redone and, uh, and that was the end of a great, you know, thing. Cause you know, with David and yeah. John, John's songwriting oh. car playing was just what, was what made that record. And you know, what, a, mm -hmm. what a totally record it was. So, maybe that started the idea in john's mind like you know fuck you i'm just gonna do this myself and i think it was a few years later that we did the blue murder record it wasn't like right away yeah but the interesting story to that is you know we work with mike stone and i remember we we're struggling a bit with guitar tones and and whatnot and i can't remember what john had listened to or heard but bob rock was next door doing something and um so he says, Bob, he says, we're, we're struggling with the guitar tone. Can you come over and give us a hand? So Bob came over and because Bob's a guitar player too, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, let's just do that. Why don't we do this? And, you know, in half an hour, I had this fucking killer tone. And so I was like, oh, oh, no way. Hell, mate. So, <laughs> so that's why he brought the Blue Murder to, to Little Mountain to have Bob produce it. And I ended up engineering that because I kind of moved up the ranks. Yeah, hung up my mop and said, "Hey, I'm not doing that anymore." <laughs> so, you know yeah. what? That that's a great that's a great story. Now I listened to a podcast from you from a few years ago, um, in regards to the Blue Murder that a tape got held up at customs. Oh yeah. Can you please can you please tell that story? It's a great story. Oh, I know. Well, yeah, you know, we had recorded the whole record in Vancouver with Carmine and Tony, and you know. That is a power trio. <laughs> like, you know, uh, well, yeah. Okay, cool. But Carmine, Tony, and John was a force to be reckoned with. But anyways, we recorded everything up there. John was looking for a singer. Well, we need a singer for this band, right? So I remember they had sent out uh, stuff, and we got all these. While we were doing guitar, we got all these tapes in. I mean, I remember one from this 11-year-old kid that had sung <laughs> along to some I don't know some song, and he was awesome. But you know, we're all like, you know, felt for this kid because he's like, he's giving it. But it's like, dude, you don't even have a chance. But of all these singers, 
there wasn't anything that was really right. And John says, you know, fuck it. He says, I'm just going to sing it myself. Well, at that point, we didn't know John could even sing. He's a guitar player. But, you know, he right. started belting out like, holy shit. Well, we sort of ran out of time. Bob was off doing another project. He says, well, let's just go down to L.A. Mike, go down there, John, and just put vocals in all these songs. I'm like, okay, cool. So we go to ship the tapes down there. I fly down to L.A. Two days later, well, where's the tapes? So we start looking, start looking. Oh, they're stuck in customs. Well, why? And, you know, they ended up being stuck in customs for like two weeks. And I'm, we're sitting there in L.A. doing nothing. Well, you know, maybe a couple of days. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, so, so we find out they're hold, holding them at customs because, you know, the, the band's called Blue Murder. You know, we've got these <laughs> things, right? So everything's marked. So Blue Murder, one of the songs is called Sex Child. Right, and then we've got yeah. a slave reel and a master reel. So, oh jeez, uh, oh. murder, sex child, slave man. They said we're not releasing these tapes till you provide us with a machine that can play these movies back. And we're like movies, well, audio. <laughs> they swore it was like a snuff film, right? And they were not going to release them until we could do that. And you know, I know the label and management. They jumped through hoops. Like I said, it was two weeks before wow. we got those tapes and i don't know what they did or who they had to pay off or what but it's like uh, no they're not they're not movies so you know <laughs> we've learned our lesson like don't always mark the box <laughs> right <laughs> right oh, no kidding um if i might uh, jump in a little bit here sure um i i saw uh, in another video you mentioned a band called the drive-by truckers uh, my buddy Eric, who's watching tonight, he's a fan of the Drive By Truckers. So is my he buddy did. Tom. But but you haven't worked with them yet, eh? No. You no, think that's uh, something? Would you want to work with a band that you love, like as a fan? You know what I do, but yeah. then I'm always leery of adding that to the list of I don't want to hear that again because it's boring. okay. Even yeah. though you're a fan, you know it's mm-hmm. it's to me sort of. Oh, hopefully we haven't oh. lost Mike. Oh, Mike's frozen. Mike is frozen. I hope hey. we haven't lost. Oh, there he is. He's go. back. Hey, <laughs> you know, with the creativity of music, quite a few years there, I was thinking, oh, I'd love to get in and do movies, but I love movies, and I would never ruin it, you know, because I've got some people that work in, in movies, and they say, oh, did you see all the edits on that one? And once you know they're there, then okay, you really yeah. see it. so same thing. But I met the the guys a, a, a bunch of times, went to some live shows, tried to sort of woo them into hey let's work together and you know they smoke a lot of pot <laughs> I remember going on their bus once and they were just all just like it was a cloud right and it's all oh, hey, I'm like oh no man I'm already baked from the you know, so great guy love that band love dead drunk awesome. and naked man yeah that's awesome so there you go check out the drive by truckers everybody yeah. cool band um, I'd like to ask a question on behalf of uh, young Tyler here, who is a uh, aspiring musician himself, and he is actually asking a question that I've been curious about myself. But the difference between analog and digital recording, pros and cons. Well, the, you know, there's a lot. Like a lot of us old guys, you know, hang on to the digital thing as like, or the sorry, the analog, the analog. Thing, and you know, it's so great, this and that. Uh, you know, if it was so great, I don't think Pro Tools and all that digital stuff would have been invented. But what what I will say and how I view it, and I prefer analog myself than digital, but how I view it, and a, and a good friend of mine that's now passed on uh, had said to me once, he says, it's sort of like, okay, you got neon lights, right? So you're in an office or your school, your classroom, you go in there. And those neon lights are just so harsh in your eyes and you're just, you know, you always get a headache and it's just like, oh my God, these freaking lights. Well, the neon light's going like this. It's flickering, right? Yeah. But you don't see it, but your brain sees it, right? But you don't right. perceive it. It's the same thing with digital. It's all zero and one. So the yeah. computers are flickering, flickering, flickering. So you don't hear the flicker, but right. your brain does. And that's why it sounds so harsh and all that. We've now become accustomed to it. They've got a little bit better with a, with a, you know, bigger sort of sample rates and whatnot. It's it's a finer mesh. It's not so 
uh, in the early 80s and you know CDs first came out it was this big giant thing now it's a lot like a finer comb so you perceive less of it but your brain still hears it and it comes out with sparseness now okay some of us have got used to it some people prefer the sound of mp3s because that's what they're used to so it's all subjective yeah but i would say as far as uh especially rock music for me analog has what it takes it's got that thump it's got higher top end because what happens in digital is they they chop off the, right. the upper frequencies that you don't hear and the lower frequencies that you don't hear but what they're chopping off is is the subharmonics so there might be 30k which you don't you know dog doesn't even hear that but the the multiples of that come down and fill in the gaps right and it's the same with the bottom end so when i listen to, to analog it might be nostalgic but when i listen to analog it's like oh yeah there's just something there that's that's got this yeah. so, uh, digital might be more correct another good analog uh, anal analogy would be pictures you know you take you right. see a movie shot in film right you see a movie shot in digital what do you prefer you know it's always going to yeah. be film right like yeah there's just something yeah, totally. amazing and it's analog and and as human beings we're analog yeah and we go to that so that's kind of my answer I oh thank you analog, but and apologies to Deke for for high uh, you know hijacking your show and tell, mm -hmm. but I, I am getting so many great questions, and I did want to highlight some. So uh, I apologize, Deke. You go back to your show and tell, shall you? You know what? I've got uh, lots of times to carry on, guys. Like, I'm, oh, oh yeah, well, thank you cool. so much. So, thank you so much. Yeah. Now back. Now we're going back a little. Can we just swing back to 1987 on a couple of records, if you don't mind? Sure, sure. And I'm that was gonna, a good year. Gonna, I'm going to grab grab one. Just give me two seconds. Mm -hmm. Yep. Oh, that one. Analog too. Yeah, that's 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 another. That's the whole intro to the Vancouver Aerosmith connection on Permanent Vacation. Now, yeah. um, I would. I'm going to ask you if you could just tell us the another story that I heard you talk about when Bruce Fairburn went out of town. Can you please, it's a great, great story on how, I guess, did you go from basically an assistant up because of what happened there? If you wouldn't yep. mind sharing it with everybody. I'll that just was be right back. the very back. first record. I'll be right back. As an engineer, I, mm -hmm. I actually, that was my first engineering credit, if you would. Mm -hmm. um, so we started doing that record, uh, Bob Rock engineering, me assisting Bruce Fairburn producing. Uh, I remember, uh, Saturday, it was a Saturday night, we had to do a load in or whatever. So me and Bob were there. And it was like, you know, nine o'clock. And we're kind of bummed because we're not really working, but we had to be there. Band showing up, the load in, we're waiting around. Like, oh, this sucks. We could be, you know, the bar, you know, whatever. And then Stephen and Joe walk in with their, their floor length duster coats on. And we're like, <laughs> we walk out the window and we're like, oh, shit. But, you know, Saturday night. <laughs> we're here for those guys yeah this is good. yeah so we're about a week into tracking permit vacation maybe a little bit more but a, about a week and bob at that time was in a band called the paolas which yep. it was doing some pretty good stuff across canada mm -hmm. for sure so he came in one day and said hey bruce he says uh we just got booked on this cross canada tour for six weeks he says i gotta go do this and he says, oh when do you go he says next week I'm like, oh, okay cool so bob took off did that and bruce says okay well cool mike can you know jump into the engineer's seat and he can finish uh, recording this so i did that i think it was another usually it took us about four weeks to record a record so it was probably another three weeks recording and during that time as we're getting closer bruce says hey mike he says, i gotta go out of town for the weekend but he says can you rough mix all the songs so that we can you know send out some demo tapes to potential guys that that are that can mix this record like, oh yeah sure so bruce takes off i come in saturday morning i'm sitting there mixing the first song Stephen and joe walk in and probably like that video <laughs> <Stanley> <laughs> and uh 
Wow. Steve, <laughs> Steve or Joe, I can't remember which one, said, uh, you're not into this, are you? And I just went, oh. I said, no, man. I said, like, you're not into doing it. You want to mix this. Go for it, man. So over the course of the weekend, uh, I got three songs mixed. So Bruce comes back Monday morning comes in and he goes oh so how do you do you know let me uh, hear you know the rough mixes whatever and i said well i only got three done and bruce is like what you know he's we <laughs> must do this yep. then. <laughs> yeah yeah and, uh, i said i got three done but uh, and, and steven says oh yeah but bruce you could gotta check it out so, hey, so bruce is all mad and anyways so he lets us the three songs so at the end of it he goes well he says i think we found our mixer so that's I awesome. Assisting to recording, and then ended up mixing mixing that record. I yeah, think I think it. John was was one of the three. For anyone that's sort of keeping. Oh, nice, nice. I think John was. Probably. Yeah, that's a great track. That's yeah. that's a that's a great story. It's like the boss leaving town, saying, mm, "Well, and then he what can... <laughs> a launch to your career!" Like you know, most yeah. guys, you know, get you know a couple of engineering things. You got to really build your way up. And I just went right from assistant to, I just did Aerosmith's <laughs> premiere. Freaking, hey, we're back! You know, straight. Here's our launch record, and mixed yeah. that. like you know, holy shit! You can't get, you can't write. Hollywood writers couldn't write a better story than that. Yeah, like, yeah. And I'm just so humble and blessed to. You know, thank you, Bob. Thank you, Bruce, and thank you, Stephen and Joe, for yeah that opportunity. You know, but you know, I was assisting about eight years up to that point. You know, a lot of guys nowadays right. want it right away, and it's like I was trained and ready for that moment. So when that moment was there, I was ready for it. Right, you put in your time. Yeah, you put in your yeah, time for sure. for sure. So another record that came out in 1987 that had the whole team back was this yeah. one which one is that oh lover lover boy yeah oh, yeah God. that, that one. i tell you back when this came out in 87 my my best yeah. buddy t-bone bought it and i used to chirp him because i said you only bought it for the cover and the back ah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but but to his credit i picked it up last year on record and i think it's probably my favorite record that album should have done way better than it did i mean yeah, yeah. some real great that stuff that on notorious? It. was notorious on that one notorious yeah yeah and yeah. uh love will rise again which is a real yeah. fantastic track that should have been mega so you know yeah. my great album there totally great album that's oh, totally what a great bunch of guys those guys all were though you know like mm -hmm. you know even from the sort of the street heart beginnings and then they all kind of morphed into this lover boy band i mean you know that's really what what seriously put vancouver on the on the the radar you know that's what yeah. i think um, the bon jovi guys heard and yeah them mm -hmm. which attracted the the you know acdc's and the aerosmith yeah. guys and, yeah everybody everybody was coming so um you also uh, branched out too on away from Vancouver. I remember buying an album by a British band called Thunder, called Backstreet Symphony, yes. produced by yeah. produced by uh, Andy Taylor from Duran yeah. Duran, and and you guys actually hooked up on that record. But then you also did a, a record right after that by a band from Baltimore called Skin and Bones. Yeah, man, Vandy. Yeah. And yeah, I I did a bit of homework, and I was like, Skin I never and Bones are an awesome band. They did nothing, but they were awesome yeah i i listened to the album on uh, youtube it's the first time i ever heard of them i was mm -hmm. like what mm -hmm. and uh you and andy you guys had a thing going too oh yeah we we did a bunch of records you know it's funny um probably my management at the time and labels anyways put andy and i together because andy was slated to do the thunder record but andy didn't want to do with somebody he didn't know so he had me come out to London and mix one of his solo records. And I don't remember what that was called or whatever, but that's when Andy and I first kind of jived and we're just, we're kind of the same people. And it was like, we totally got on and he says, okay, well, let's do the Thunder record. So we went out to this, this place called Great Linford Manor. And it's out in the, so the Midlands out in England. And it's one of the most haunted places, right? <laughs> and so it's got a big manor house and then there's a, 
a couple of alms houses or whatever they call them, so where I guess where the workers stayed. So I, I stayed at one of them, and it was like it was so old that the all the floors were like tilted <laughs> and all that. And then there's another house. So there's two separate studios there. The one in the big house was like a little SSL kind of studio, and the one in the smaller house was a Neve. We said, well, we want to record the band on Neve. But we want them to set up the house because it had the big room, the big drum room, and all that, the sort of the banquet room or whatever it was. So they had trenches or whatever out there, but they spent a whole weekend running cables out to the outside to tie the two studios together. So we had no a, the outside studio on the knee board <laughs> with a band, and they had sort of rudimentary cabins because it was you know back in those days you didn't have the the webcams and all that stuff. So we had sort of rudimentary cameras. We could watch these guys and that's how we, we did that record. But we lived, we lived there in that house. It was four or six weeks and it was awesome out in the English countryside. Uh, on weekends, they'd have a bunch of their friends come up, drive up from London. So it was probably a two or three hour drive and we'd have these huge parties and the guy in the band, um, Harry James. Uh, yep. uh, so we'd have a, down in the in the basement we had these kegs of beer and, you know you'd go down to the basement you could fit maybe 30 people down there but you know you're like kind of like this and we <laughs> got lights whatever so we called it harry's bar so that was the place to be if you could get in on the weekends you know if i was late working <laughs> trying to get into harry's bar later was forget it but, uh, <laughs> lots of good little ghosty stories there but man freaking what a wreck we'd play uh cricket like a sort of like rounders uh you know a, not a full match would be like a half hour match after dinner we'd all go up there and play so i got turned on to cricket during that <laughs> what a record it was great yeah it should have done way better in north america like the danny boys and luke morley those guys singer yeah. and guitar they wrote a great batch of songs and they awesome. they're still going today they're still going yeah well yeah. they came they got signed to geffen and they came here and i think i co-produced the record or or at least did the record here and we did it in atlanta and la i think and mm -hmm. just americans just weren't into it yeah that's europe that's, england they freaking eat those guys up but just didn't catch on over the side i know wow. it's kind of funny when i read articles in magazines and they're talking about that album and you know five singles or however many there were and here in canada we saw one on much music like yeah. twice that the two yeah. times that they played it yeah, yeah. They're really unfortunate. I know Danny is like exactly like he's a ringer for Paul Rogers, that quality yeah. voice. Yeah. He's great. Oh, it's, it's so sad. clear, powerful, and still to this day, you know, he's he's kicking it. Still bringing it. So before we get to everybody wants to talk about ACDC, I have to ask <laughs> oh, look I at have, that. Oh, I got to go. <laughs> <laughs> I have to ask you about van halen balance yes i know we had some people asking about van halen balance in the comments can you give us a, a backstory like i always like the backstory like when bruce obviously would get hired for to produce a record back then does he say hey i'm bringing my team with me and you guys just kind of like how how does that whole how did that whole process work well that one actually funny enough was was kind of a reverse process uh i got asked to come in uh to help the guys with their pre-pro so i met up with eddie and 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 mike and them and alex uh at uh, eddie's studio mm -hmm. in uh Topanga or whatever canyon thing there and i forget even how that got hooked up but anyways i went there so we went through and we recorded a whole bunch of demos uh I remember alex and i going through really specifically trying to get a drum sound that's in his head and i'm like alex you know your drums have sound great on all your records and he goes i've hit every one of them <laughs> wow so I remember doing that i remember um you know getting tones with eddie and eddie was freaking awesome like what a guy he was at that point was sober i remember him yep. drinking a lot of uh the non-alcoholic beer or duels or something or whatever it was but um and that val saw val then i think that was before before the kid but anyways um yeah we a lot of great times hanging out there i remember uh eddie had just got his uh 
this magical martial head back from Holland that had they restored it. And that's yeah. why he switched over to more of a rig stereo sound. Yeah. And he loved that so much that when they did, well, what was that one record where it was all just keyboards? See, he liked the big lush stereo thing and he found he could get a lot more of that on keyboards than the guitar. Anyway, so he got his head back. So I remember plugging it in and like, Dad, dude, fucking let's, let's do this. And we plug it in. Holy shit, it sounded awesome. But he just, he didn't want to do it. He wanted, he just like that, the stereo thing he did. So, we did a bunch of demos. Sammy came in and, and sung on some of them. So that was the first time I met Sammy. And and then I had to take off to do a record. Uh, they were kind of ready to go. And, and I remember Ed going, hey, Mike, he says, we need, uh, you know, we're kind of looking for production. You know, and I'm not a producer. And I said, oh, you know who you guys got to check out is Bruce, Bruce Fairburn. So I put them together. So it was all decided when I was done, whatever I was off doing, we'd all get together and, and do the record. Well, things changed. Bruce got in a hurry, whatever. They ended up recording it with Bruce somewhere else. So that was cool. Uh, when I got finished, whatever I was doing, I came back and I, and I got to mix it. So that was, that was a, a, a plus. So it was, yeah. it, it was a fun record. Like Eddie and I were like long lost brothers, man. Like, you know, we'd go golfing and we'd hang out Oh, that's cool. And yeah, I don't know what happened over the years. We kind of lost connection, but he was a cool guy. Yeah. 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 I'm going to miss him. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, for sure. Yeah. 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 The day that that news came out, I was in a, I was in a bit of a state and I, my wife was giving me shit for being grumpy around the house. And I was like, baby, Eddie Van Halen died. Like, come on. You know? Yeah. And she's like, oh, sorry. I get it. Yeah. <laughs> Um, free of suffering though that's that's how i love yeah that. yeah absolutely yeah, yeah. totally that's the only totally. the only silver lining really yeah but, well if you don't mind i'd like to jump into an acdc question okay. um mm -hmm. this is uh, it's funny i was listening to another podcast uh, that i think was recorded back in september before anybody knew about power up and uh, you were very coy about yeah, they asked you about what you knew and you were very coy but how do you keep an acdc sized secret under your hat for such a long time. Like you must be the best poker player because there's no I way, pe <laughs> you know, I wouldn't be at music if I was the best. Poker player. <laughs> <laughs> but like that, like everybody must've been asking and you can't say anything because it's AC freaking DC. Well, you know what? I, there's one thing about, you know, doing this and growing up in Vancouver. And I think what made, you know, Bruce and Bob and, and a lot of us, you know, really good is because, you know, we're doing it for the pure reason of, of creating something great, you know. So we we're always chasing the Toronto guys or the L.A. guys or the New York guys. And we've got, because we're such a young town, we didn't have any of the great gear and the old microphones from the old radio state. We, like, we had fuck all. So we had to really work hard. And part of that working hard is, is you're there for the artists. So. What happens in the room stays in the room. And that was just the law. It wasn't like you didn't have to sign a non-disclosure. I remember one record I had to sign a non-disclosure. I'm like, what the fuck is this shit? You know, this is, you know, it's insulting because I ain't saying shit about what's going on here until you guys do. So, so it's actually super easy for us to not say shit. Like it's yeah. hard when you're getting interviewed. And I know there's one point where, you know, the record's been done, whatever. The pictures all got out there for the yeah. paparazzi guys. And somebody in the interview had said something about, you know, this. Well, in my mind, it's, well, it's obviously we're, we're there doing the record. You got me and <laughs> Brian and, you know, well, then that exploded. Like, oh, Mike Fraser confirms the record's freaking done. And, you know, I'm getting kind of shit from the band for that. But, well, it's sort of obvious. I didn't say anything. <laughs> So that was the only time that I really felt uh, that I let the team down. But know? even then, a lot of people yeah. were, were still skeptical. Like, that picture could have been from the Black Ice sessions. Like, a lot of people, there were a lot of skeptics out there that were yeah. saying, listen, there's nothing. And, and truly, as far as the public were concerned, there really was nothing confirmed until ACDC say it. It ain't. Like yeah. uh, there was also speculation. Yeah. Well, maybe Mike was working on some B sides for a box set or a live album. Or, there were lots of 
yeah, possibilities, for, right? For sure. Yeah. Yeah. But you know, to answer your question, it, it, it's actually pretty easy to keep tight lip because it's like, shut up, it's none of your business what we're doing here. <laughs> like, you know, uh, it, mm-hmm. it becomes harder when, you know, because there's, you know, you see Brian or Cliff or somebody out in, in the restaurants or you capture a picture of them having a smoke. It's pretty hard to kind of deny right. anything. But, right. You know, that's that was probably the only harder part about it is, is denying the obvious. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But I am going to uh, take us to a question mm-hmm. by a good friend of the show, Mr. Kevin Simister, otherwise known as Buried on Mars, and he has a question that he submitted by video. Okay. So, hopefully you can see and hear this just fine. Let's cut to Kevin Simister. Hello, everyone. Uh, Hello, Mike Frazier. Uh, This is a great opportunity for me to ask uh, you a question. I'm a little bit of an ACDC fan, and I've been enjoying your work for quite a while now. Um, So, when Mike asked me to uh, send in a video question, uh, I was actually uh, watching No Bull at the time. Uh, so I got a million questions for you, but I thought I'd go with the one uh, about uh, No Bull. So uh, this uh, concert film originally came out in 1996, and according to the story that I know, um, the film was rushed out onto store shelves to meet the holiday season in 1996, and the director, David Mallet was not pleased with the uh, final results of the uh, audio. Uh, so that's why in 2008 we got the director's cut, with a new 5.1 mix for Blu-ray and um, DVD. Uh, So I was wondering, because you were the engineer on both projects, uh, if you could shed any light on what uh, David wasn't pleased with with the original mix, maybe if you shared some of those uh, same views, and uh, maybe what you did to improve the audio in 2008, and maybe just talk a little bit in general, about what it takes to do a 5.1 mix versus a stereo mix. I think I got myself about three or four questions in there for the price of one. Uh, So I'll thank uh, Deke and Mike for allowing me to send in uh, this question. And Mike, thank you so much for your answer in advance. I said one question, Kevin. I said (laughs) one. I'm not answering any of them. No, no. Disqualified. (laughs) Well, you know, on that gig, that was in the Madrid, Spain, yeah. and it was a, it was a big Coliseum like looking plate, like it was fabulous. And anybody that hasn't been to Spain, you gotta go, like you know, when we can. But um, it's amazing, like the food and the the culture and the wine was amazing. But you know, to be in Madrid, so this this stadium that we're in uh, had just hosted a uh, bullfight. Matador and all that, right? So in some areas there's still the sawdust. You could still smell the blood. In the no, no, oh I, my no God. it was fascinating. Like you know, I'm not saying you know anything about you know I love killing animals and whatever you want to do, <laughs> thing, but it was fascinating because of the tradition and it's hundreds, if not thousands, of years of tradition. Yeah, so it's yeah. like kind of cool. So from what I know, you know, Dave, I know David quite well. Um, but from what I know, him and I had never discussed anything. I don't know if it was rushed out for the holiday season or any of that stuff. But, you know, project gets recorded, project gets done, mixed, but it, out it goes. And I think maybe what David's thing was that, that the 5-1 fix for him is because they had such a lot of great shots, you know, helicopter shots of the, the stadium and all that. And then here's the sound in the stereo kind of field didn't didn't give the grandeur that what his shots were portraying right so when we redid it for five one (coughs) excuse me all of a sudden oh and there it is there's there's the grandeur i was looking for it wasn't really that we changed anything or or edited the band or edited the performance it was just taking it from that to that so really, it was expanding it from a stereo mix yeah, to a five point yeah. one. And you know, and that then to answer his other question, you know, that's kind of what I do when I do a, a live, you know, five one. Is I'm basically doing a super wide stereo, like you know, I've 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 seen some other live stuff. Uh, won't mention what, but you know, as an audience, you're sitting there watching this video, 
you don't want to have an acoustic guitar kind of poking you in the back of your head when the guy's <laughs> sitting there. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. It's got to visually work. And, you know, I'm sorry. We all, when we go to concert and everything, that's what it is. There's the band, and that's what we see. You know, maybe some of the surround stuff that's more dance band, Michael Jackson, okay, you can have stuff flying through your head. More gimmicky, but yeah. That, kind of yeah. Rock band, and especially live, there they are. So what I do is I just do a super wide. So instead of having a stereo, you know, I'll spread the guitars out to to maybe the three and nine o'clock thing so that the stage is all of a sudden bigger. Uh, the big thing I've discovered with 5.1 that's always trickier is you've got to have a ton of audience mics to make that seem real. You can't just have four mics up and try and surround it the more mics you have you know then when when that one guy whistles at the end of the song he is there not kind of there you know so that that's really what tricks your mind into like i'm here is that ambient it's not where the band is the band's on stage man like you know you, basically you can put up a mono signal and then but it's everything else. And, you know, that's what movies do to fool you into thinking you're there is, is where they place these things. And you need multiple mics to make it real because your hearing is amazing, man. Like what you pick off of reflections in that, it's not just, you'll know, stick a microphone there and that's what I hear. Like right. you hear so many things. So you're trying to fool that. So that's what I try and do. I make the band as big and punchy as I can in a, in a wider stereo thing if you go too wide the, the punch goes away so you make it punchy and live there they are try and get the audience in and effective so that's kind of what i aim for for live stuff that's awesome <laughs> well i hope kevin's happy that that uh with that answer to his four questions i've received this question now three times so i can't ignore it Okay. Uh, Mr. Eric Litwiller, thanks for being on. Deke is so right about the sound holding up well. One of my favorite songs is Where Is This Love by the Paolas. I love the sound of that song. Still sounds awesome on headphones today. Yeah. 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 yeah Which is, band. you mentioned Bob Rock's band. That's Bob Rock's band. Yeah. Bob Rock's band. Yeah. You know, you know um, Mike, speaking of ACDC, I know it took forever and a day for them to get their music on to iTunes and on your website it says that you remastered or took care of all of it for uh, mm -hmm. get all their music out on iTunes how did that uh, process work like that is a lot of music <laughs> yeah, going, yeah you know like well, you know it was the the late great uh, George Marino at Sterling Sound uh, mastered it uh, you mm -hmm. know he mastered it most of the records I've done and Bob and Bruce have done, like, you know, he was an absolute genius, great guy. Um, so the catalog came up, uh, you know, ACDC always held out because they didn't, yep. they didn't like the, the cut that the fans were getting versus what, you know, like they yep. had a lot of things against that. Mm -hmm. As time goes on, they said, okay, this is probably the best, digital way of doing it and the fairest to the bands and stuff but they were holding on not for their gain it was for everybody else kind of like the metallica when they fought the the napster thing you know yeah. um, so anyways they decided okay we're going on itunes isn't that you know it was another one of those super secret you know you had to show up with a tape with a briefcase and, <laughs> and uh so but it was the first time i think ever that all the original tapes were in the same building together. So we had all the mixed tapes from every wow. every record that that they could find or were of quality. <clears throat> and you know, we had to bake a lot of the tapes. Most of it's done on an analog, so we had to bake the tapes. Because what happens is the glue starts coming off. <laughs> okay, thanks. Hang on a second. <laughs> I, I had it written down somewhere, but yeah, there it is. Thermal tape baking. Have you ever done this? <laughs> yes. Can you can you can First you expand on that? The tech guys do that, and they they basically because you got to do it gently, so it's not it's in an oven, but it's not really an oven. It's a light bulb with a fan, and there's a certain temperature, and I can't remember if it's two hundred and ten Fahrenheit or whatever. But basically, what happens over age is 
the glue on the tape starts drying out and the backing starts falling off the tape on the on the other side of the backing is is the magnetic side where all the all the recording go so once the backing falls out the tape just kind of starts disintegrating so when you bake it it melts the glue a bit so it now holds together and you can get that stuff off tape uh trouble with baking is is it makes the tape a little bit weaker so you've only got a few passes on that tape to get quality it's not going to be the same quality but a, a, a quality off the tape and the more you bake it the less the quality goes the more you play it things are falling off like you know you wouldn't leave the shedding we call it on the on the actual heads like every time the tape passes you clean the head and your your q-tip is just black with all everything that's come off and that's all the audio so it's yeah it's a bit of a process oh, no. tape sheds worse like there's a whole period in the mid 80s where the tape whatever the chemical baths and were are horrible there's you know 85 to 86 a lot of tapes just you just can't get back right but anyways we had all the tapes together at sterling they bake them to this and that mm -hmm. and we retransfer them because what usually happens when they they've taken it off the tapes they make it like a, a copy or a digital copy or whatever and then every format run gets done from that so when they make you know thing oh, we go to that copy so we made brand new copies of everything from the originals and george and i spent a lot of time historically getting the sounds close to the records that they were but also trying to bolster them a bit to the modern listeners you know right. we didn't want to make them super loud and change we wanted so we did a lot of time a being different uh analog uh you know vinyl stuff and you know like uh some of the earlier stuff the vinyl in australia was way different than the vinyl in america or the vinyl in the uk so we had to sort of like well, which way did we go here like you know some in australia they sped the song up some here they did that like you know so we tried to make it historical to the fans and i don't remember which song but there was one song i remember mal says oh he says yeah that one it's just they released the wrong version. He says, you know, it doesn't have, or we cut this whole section out or whatever to make the song shorter. He says, you know, can we please, he says, it's bothered me for years. Can we please do the edit? And it's okay, cool. What do you want? So we did the edit. Oh, when the box set came out, I remember that was one of the big things of the fans. Like, oh, these guys, the band probably never even listened to this. You know, who's, <laughs> uh, they, just, they even cut a whole section of Angus's solo out or whatever. And I'm like, Oof. holy shit. We were asked to do that, you know? It's like, it's wow, funny. geez. I love that box set. Now my illusions are all shattered. <laughs> you know, it's funny. When we uh, when we uh, uh, were doing Back in Black and we got the tapes and it was all wrapped in the, in tinfoil because that helps keep the moist, moisture out, right? So, and I remember mm. we put those on the thing and check the tones, everything's good. Winded it and George hit play on the thing. And you know the first thing you hear is the house bells, right? And we're like, yep. Holy fuck! That record we hard even had to touch, even at that point, sounded so freaking awesome. <laughs> like, like I'm still going. <laughs> oh shit! Those guys fucking killed it on that record. That was great. One of the all-time greats, that's for sure. Yeah. 41 years young. 41 years no young. No pun indeed. intended. Yeah. <laughs> Deke, do you, have, uh, do you have any more burning questions? I got, Mike, before we let you go, I got one, one more question. Now, back in the 90s, you were asked to uh, remix an album by a certain band, and you turned them down. Now, I read this, and it was this record. Yeah, yeah. How did they how did they take that when you told whoever it was no nah, I'm not touching it <laughs> you know at, you know at that point it was all done through management so I don't know how, oh, how okay. it took it. Um, yeah and I tell you you know it's it's one of my you know growing up favorite records I can't mm -hmm. tell you how many uh, cups of tea I drank <laughs> <and> listening <laughs> to that on headphones you know. yeah. 
wow but then you know as an engineer you start thinking about it like you know okay well what's the quality of the tape and the music now uh do i have the same gear they had when they mixed it like and i thought you know i don't want to go down in history as the guy that ruined dark side of the moon right right Ooh, yeah good right, point right. You know, yeah. Good good perfect point. perfect record and i ain't touched yeah. so that's why i said no um, yeah funny enough I, I don't remember if it was before or after but chris kimsey and i had done a whole big show for nebworth uh it was a two or three day event and it was like you know the who's who genesis yeah, there's a oh, cd uh, of that i believe yeah, uh, that yeah. Is a double double cd abridged but, abridged obviously from the full show but yeah yeah maybe slightly but it's a double cd so i remember at the end yeah. like there's i think they had two trucks chris was in one and i was in one and then they had a, a triangular revolving stage so band performing band setting up band tearing down and then they'd go like that so it would happen and, and when they switch things it would switch trucks so we were always it just went like you know you didn't have to do the 20 minute 30 30 minute switch over it was like 10 minutes and the next band was going so when we came to mix it there was so much stuff to mix chris says well look he says let's just split it he says i'll go in one studio mix you go in another studio to mix so so one of the songs i got to mix was uh comfortably numb right and it was awesome nice. was, they were right at the, uh, at the end of the show and it started raining it's night so the rain with the lasers was amazing right <laughs> All yeah. and i remember this you know iconic shot of, of david gilmore with his guitar playing the solo on that and the, the rain was dripping off his hands and off the guitar and the lasers and all oh, was great. So I remember I was mixing away on that and I just had it crank. And I usually mix in pretty low volume, but you know, I just had that just pinned. And I'm, like, and I'm vaguely aware of a movement behind me, but you know, whatever, I'm get into it. <laughs> hey, should we wide and I look back and there's David standing there going like that. <laughs> Holy shit! I feel like I felt like I'm a that big. Here's one of my giant idols. Yeah. Sounds good, man. Sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Yeah, that's so awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I I uh, have asked all the questions that I I mean I could keep going, but you know I I realize I have, I have one story that I want to sort of rewind. I thought we we're going to make please, it. yeah, please, yeah. yeah. So it goes back to the cult. Okay. We're doing, we're doing Sonic Temple. There it is right there. Yeah. Uh, you know, we started off, I think it was in LA doing demos and when Bob and I are like, Hey, you know, how do you feel like about doing a cult? Fuck yeah. <laughs> we started yeah. Off in LA, uh, you know, Ian, Billy and I and Bob and just the whole band, we just really hit it off. So anyway, so we do the record in Vancouver and, and uh god there's so many great memories of you know all those songs you know chow Edie and and mm -hmm. all those things but anyways so they had this song called the river yes yes now that's hard to find i don't know what it's on because i haven't... it's on the b-side to sweet soul sister is it and it's on the uh it's on the i believe there's a sonic temple box set it's and it's actually on, a... on the it's actually on the vinyl too Reissue, a, really, because I tried yeah. to find it over the years because we did it, mixed it all, and then it didn't make the cut. Yeah, yeah. But the river. So, what we did when we recorded that because we wanted this vibe, and it's a long song, and you know, Ian was just all into about the vibe. So, what we did is we went, and at you know, at the time, Little Mountain did all lots of uh, uh, jingles and uh, movie scores, right? So we did out in the big tracking room we had one of those giant video screens that you had to project onto right it was right. <laughs> uh so what we did is we went and rented apocalypse now we must have oh. had 500 candle like we shut off all the lights and put candles everywhere and so the band went out there and i think we did three live takes of this to them playing to apocalypse now in the dark with just candles and all that so that's the river is, is wow. the river. wow the river. i never made river. that connection yeah yeah and it was so amazing so you know i, I wondered like because i looked for it for a, a little bit well sort of before internet i could probably mm -hmm. find it now but I looked many times for it because i wanted to try and sync it up to the river again and just 
because I remember doing it was like it was all about vibe and that thing just drift vibes. Yes. Silly and they just got into it with just the, that's uh, just, yeah. yeah. Awesome. That's such a that's such a huge record. Like that's another record that when you hear the opening riff of uh Firewoman on the radio. Yeah. Like yeah. you and Bob, you guys grand slammed on that record. I mean, that <laughs> is like that record could have now that I I always had it on CD and for Christmas my daughter's uh bought it for me and yeah. uh on vinyl for the first time. Oh nice. Nice and, <laughs> Yeah, great yeah, kid. He's, yeah. he's a lucky man. Yeah, they buy me a lot of vinyl, so but it sounds like like it came out last week. Oh, right on. And yeah. That's yeah. kudos to you guys, man. Like, thank you for the sonics, the music, everything, man. Like, seriously. Well, I'll great. say, you know, wrapping up, you know, the one thing I've learned through my whole career, like, you know, of course, Bruce Fairburn was all about, you know, doing this and yep. that. But really, what it is, is like, you've got to, we're trying to capture magic. And yeah. You can't you, you can't manufacture magic, and that's where mm. a lot of things have gone now with with the Pro Tools, and it's so easy to change and manipulate things and make it sound how you, you want it to sound, which is yeah. great. Mm -hmm. But there's there's no exchanging magic for it. Mm -hmm. and magic should happen fast. You can't sit there in a room for twenty hours and expect the magic to happen so that's what bruce's thing was okay if it's not here now okay go and figure it out at the hotel room and we'll capture the magic later like yeah it's about having fun and i know a lot of the records i've done are big successful great sounding records are we had a lot of fun doing that yeah it was work but mm -hmm. there was fun moments and we captured magic and that's yeah. really kind of disappearing in music nowadays um because everybody manufactures music now. They don't capture yeah. it necessarily. So, you know, when you look at 60s, 70s, 80s music, mm -hmm. that was magic. And now we're getting into, oh, but magic is this, and we must make it like this. And it's like, yeah, no, that's not always the thing. Yeah. Well, some some latest magic that you've been involved with is, is this yes. album. <laughs> and what I can tell you, Mike, is that you could change side one to side two and vice versa and lead off the album with either side like right on. 10 yeah. the songs are all solid like the album just goes right till the end i mean we all love it we we do our like fanboy top 10 lists and all of us we all we had all them in the, power up power yeah. up was right up there with everything i mean it's oh, such great. a great record so kudos to you and uh brendan and obviously the yeah. band thanks for bringing back rock and roll in yeah, 2020 man. And miss the time, eh? Man, what a... Yeah. Well, Mike, just before you up. go, uh, yeah. that track, The River, if you uh -huh. check out the Sonic Temple 30 box set, you can get The River, and uh, The River Demo is also on that box set. Oh, it's so a there's demo. A, Yeah, that's, that's a four-CD set. I part of the demo, so I don't care about oh, that. No. <laughs> <laughs> but there you go. Yeah. You can It can be had. Oh, great. Awesome. Thanks, yeah. Yeah. So hey, Mike, take power up and sync it up to... Uh, uh, the Wizard of Oz. The Wizard of Oz. <laughs> it, <no. laughs> you ever done that with Dark Side of the Moon? I have not, but I think no. I'm gonna now. <laughs> it is amazing. Like even if you're not bait, it's like, what the hell? <laughs> it's amazing. That's yeah. amazing. So, well, Guys, Mike, we. It's been thank great. You. I gotta go. Uh, make yes. Make yeah, absolutely. Thank, thank you, buddy. So thank you so much. Yeah, please, please, please come back and uh, talk to us sometime down the road. We'd Anytime. love to have you back. Oh, that's right. so awesome. Yeah. Take care, uh, man. T stay I safe as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And too bad I couldn't see some of the questions. So I hope, you know, everybody got their questions answered. But we'll as have many as we could. As many as we could. <laughs> we'll have you back. We'll have you back yeah. for a QA and a man, cool. for sure. Anytime. Right. Thanks. Take care, buddy. Have a great cheers. night, guys. Yeah, yeah cheers. You Take care, yeah. Mike. Bye. <laughs> 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 How do I get out of this thing? <laughs> there, um, there, there, I'll just do it the manual. There we go. There we go. Okay, Deke, so a little bit of this we're not worthy stuff. A little bit of this we're not worthy stuff. Yeah. Um, I'm not going to give you a rest. I am not going to give you a second of rest because of what Chris Sarge <laughs> just said here. 
uh, balls of steel. <laughs> Uh, the reason you have that nickname is because you just have balls of steel and you will ask anybody for anything. Uh, Lana said earlier that I don't pay you enough, which is true, but I can pay you in love. I can pay you in love, and so can T-Bone pay you in love. Oh, shit. Dun, dun, dun. I would like to introduce to you the brand new single by T-Bone Erickson called Balls of Steel on the LeBrain Tree. Runs cold, and he doesn't feel many legends told of his balls of steel. <laughs> you better listen up. Never had a care. Never worried who was there He just looked you in the eye And like a tiger hunting prey Now he decides Oh, if you live or if you die Try to run, but there's no place to hide Well, his blood runs cold And it doesn't feel many legends told Of his balls of steel Bigger than a freaking Ferris wheel Now you've been warned He's got balls of steel He's a little bit insane Don't give a shit's his middle name When he's got you in his sights That's when you must wisely choose your demise Oh, do you flee or do you fight? But you won't have much time before he strikes Because his blood runs cold and it doesn't feel Many legends told of his balls of steel Bigger than a freaking Ferris wheel Now you've been warned he's got balls of steel He sent me that before, just before work this morning. Oh, God. How could you focus after that? Oh, dude, I played that video like three times at work today. <laughs> oh, man, it kills me. I just, I was going, what the hell's wrong with Bruce Willis's face? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. It took, it took me oh, a minute. Then I'm like, oh, shit, it's Deke. They're all Deke. <laughs> ah. 
Uh, I don't even know if I should be putting this comment on the screen. No, get that no, off. no, no. Oh my God, so many, so many great comments though. We got uh, Deep Fate, oh. Sake Deke, Deke McLean, uh, Fate Face Swallapalooza. Awesome job, T Bone. Yeah. Uh, Lana likes the black and white scenes. We got we had Deke Harris in there. T Bone loves you, man. And. Well, Eric, uh, I really appreciate this. He, best interview on this show ever. Pop Off was great, but that segment was perfectly executed by you guys. And Fraser was cool as fuck. Congrats yeah, to the three of you. That's uh, you know, like I know we were going, geez, you know, we were going to get a half hour with Mike. Or are we going to get, you know? But it was awesome. Like he was just full of, you know, what? Just hearing those stories, and um, you know, it was like the Coverdale Page Studio being locked and. You know, it doesn't get any better. I mean, that guy is that guy. He's VIP at this. Yeah. This brain train, man. Like. Yeah. Fuck. Yeah. Um, oh man, I, I'm still psyched out by that video, and, man. And there were so so many great comments. I, again, I couldn't get to all of them, but I tried to tried to 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 give some of these guys at least one question each. But whew, you know, holy that's, crap! That's, like that guy is like a ton of rock, man. Like that was just, yeah. And the fact yeah. that he just was willing to to chew the Fat. the fat, yeah. Basically, our fanboy questions were all answered about. And he, and he listened. He listen. listened to the uh, the T Bone theme song and liked it. It was yeah. in his head. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like that's Mike Fraser liking T Bone shit, man. <laughs> well, Lana knew something. Better that. Lana knew something was fishy when she saw your face on TLR. <laughs> yeah, I don't know about this part. Oh, well, that was funny. Uh, I, when oh, he sent man. me that this morning, I, I couldn't watch the whole thing before work. I just I got it uploaded onto the site so that I could play it. And then I watched it at work, and I was like, holy crap, this is so good. This is so but funny. Then, but then, you know, it, like, it really gives me a lot of street cred with that Scarface scene. Yes. You know? You saw that. Yeah, oh. off the roof. Oh man, that was oh. what a crazy guy. But that's why he's been my best friend since '75. The same damn year as Kiss Alive. And I cannot wait to talk to him next week on Feb Five. Oh, we're gonna have a blast, man! Especially when we dissect that Done with Mirrors record. And I mean, that's why I figured we bring uh, Uncle Meat and Kevin just to give you some backup because we might pummel you right, bulldoze you right over. Yeah. So we thought, you know what? We don't want to be unruly guests. Fair enough. <laughs> I think uh, I think okay. we're probably going to play Balls of Steel again next week, probably. But well, that actually, is T Bone has uh, the Current River video too. So right, that was not oh, the new Current River video. No, no, we, no. we promised we were going to debut a new Current River tonight with T Bone, but we had to bump T Bone. So the Current River tune, I'll give you guys all the title. It's one of the best tunes that I ever wrote, and it's the title is called "Rockin' in a Rubber." Oh yes, so, the legendary "Rockin' in a Rubber." Legendary. Rockin' in a rubber, and we'll talk about it when he's on next week because he wrote the yeah. lyrics to it, and it's brilliant. So, uh, you know what? I, I he was probably up till probably about five in the morning. I bet you doing that damn Super Balls tune. <laughs> Super Balls. Ah, well, that's the thing, though. That's the thing is that uh, he actually got the idea from Chris Sar. Chris Sar is to blame. Uh, Chris mentioned oh, this yeah, in a comment. comment. Yeah. Like, what was that? Like Tuesday. So yeah. between, like, let's say Tuesday and today, he put together a song with lyrics and a guitar solo and a music video. Well, and plus, and plus, he sent me <laughs> sent me a, a picture or a, a text the other morning. Uh, I get up at 5, 5 a.m. And he sent me a text at 2 a.m. And he goes, man, I just finished watching that pump, making a pump video. That was only 4 a.m. Yes. Yeah, you know, like, dude, I'm going to work. You were just up two hours ago. <laughs> well, I'll probably up, be up till 2 a.m. tonight just out of sheer, sheer adrenaline. Because yeah, that was okay. the most fun chat that we've had on the show in, in a dog's age. And that's yeah, nothing that was... against anybody else. But, uh, mm. oh, my God. I, I mean, that's, I mean, he shaped our, like I said to him, like you shaped our, our sonic musical landscape. I mean, you're on all right? those records and it was fun just to pull out those records and show him because, you know, like he was like Crocus the Blitz, you know? Yeah. So, uh, yeah, there's the boss liking T-Bone's tunes. 
<laughs> well, you know, like I'd, I'd be growing up hearing these songs on Much Music, and they'd be talking about Little Mountain Studios, and I would imagine it in my head, and imagine yeah. Bob Rock sitting at a desk, or Bruce Fairburn. Oh, there's Mike. Thank you for joining and listening. Sorry we didn't get around to all the questions. That was a lot of fun. Uh, thanks, man. Well, maybe next time we'll, we'll line up the questions for next time. There were so many we could have gone on for seven or eight hours. And for, for you people out there, uh, if you want to, go check uh, Mike's actual website where he's right. listed all his bands he's worked with. Like he even said, like he was trying to edit it and it's like 10 pages. Right. You, your mind will be blown at who he's worked with. Like we didn't even touch on Poison Flesh and Blood and we didn't touch on a bunch of other things. So, you know, I'll just could, uh, easily I'll put his uh, website in the banner here real quick. Yeah. And, uh, you know. So there you go. Check him out at MikeFraserMix.com. Yeah. And the best was, you know, and I, you know, you know me, I'm a huge Sykes fan. So just yeah. to hear the guy who's actually in house with all that going on, I mean, <laughs> fanboy appreciation night here. I think, I think for brain. me, for me, it's Sonic Temple. Yeah. Um, 1989 was a formative year in my rock and roll life. You had so much activity going on at Little, Little Mountain with Pump, mm -hmm. Dr. Yep. Feel Good, yeah. and, uh, you know, The Cult, which w all three of which were huge that year. Uh, that was a big year for me. I had my first girlfriend, and uh, she was into the same music as me, but she didn't like The Cult. So there's a matter of pride for me on, uh, listening to Sonic Temple and hearing songs like Sweet Soul Sister, which is a massive tune. And and you know, reading the credits and here's here's a guy named Mike Fraser and yeah. you don't necessarily know what an engineer is at that age and you, oh. you don't necessarily know who Mike Fraser is at that age, but then you see his name again when you buy the Blue Murder album. Yeah. You see his name again when you buy the Coverdale Page album. And it becomes cemented in your head. But when you said on Saturday, when you said, Oh, I got Mike Fraser for next week, I'm like <laughs> Instantly, instantly, like my brain's just like the discography's going da -da 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 in my head, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I mean, we didn't even touch on his his fantastic work with Satriani, no. Chicken Foot. Like, no. we could easily have him back for another ninety minutes. So I'll yeah. hit him up. We'll hit, or I shouldn't say I will now hit him up down well, the road for sure. You, know, you, uh, yeah. you have the. It's your responsibility <laughs> because you have the theme song now. You know that's. <laughs> That's yeah. your that's your payment. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. Yeah, John Snow was yeah, watching. Man. Thanks for watching, Johnny. Yeah, and that uh, was a, that was a great night, Mike. Thanks for like I said, I told you this before. Thanks for having this forum where we can do this kind of thing. And ah, it's my this, this kind of night, this kind of night is what makes it worthwhile. It's my pleasure. I'm 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 both exhausted and full of adrenaline right now. <laughs> yeah. But uh, I think I'm going to take off and head upstairs yep. and grab something to eat. But uh, we'll be back next Friday night at 7 with the one and only, the legendary T-Bone. T-Bone Erickson. Uncle Meat and Mr. Kevin Buried on Mars and myself and the guy there. That, this, this guy here. That guy here. Um, he is going to be... Uh... Uh... <laughs> I just, uh, I'm exhausted, and yet, uh, and yet not. Um, I guess what I was going to say is I'm really looking forward to next week and hanging out with my buddies, and we'll be talking in depth about yep. Aerosmith's Done With Mirrors album. Track by track, baby. Track by track. I swear to God I will do this, even though I don't like the album all that much. Yet, you know what? Interestingly mm -hmm. enough, though, as much as this is not my favorite Aerosmith album, mm -hmm. there, I have two favorite Aerosmith songs tied mm -hmm. for first place. Okay. Opening track of Done With Mirrors is one of the two. So there I you know go. that. I've been, I've been doing some uh, research at MikeLadano.com. <laughs> so, uh... <laughs> yeah, you got it, buddy. So uh, once more, we're going to run the LeBrain Train theme song by T-Bone Erickson as the outro. Thank you, everybody, for watching. Now, yeah, everybody please. go turn on your Disney Plus and watch WandaVision, because I saw tonight's episode, and it's a freaking mind blower. Without spoilers. And then after, and then after that pull out any Mike Fraser yeah. engineered or produced record and crank it tonight. Yeah, actually, order this one from wherever you can get it. It wasn't released in North America, The Stone Gods. Order this one. It is freaking great. It's the guys from The Darkness. Check out the earlier part. Ordered Sonic Temple! Get that one. Check them out. Alright, Deke, well, I guess we'll see you next week. We will and, see you um, week. I'll, uh, I'll send you the link for that YouTube video so you can watch it whenever you like. 
<laughs> it's going to get on heavy rotation now. Huh? I know it will be. When do your daughters see it? <laughs> <laughs> well, they probably already have. <laughs> All right, All right bro. Take Say, care, bud. Thank you, and thanks, everybody, for watching. Here is the LeBrain Train theme song by T-Bone Erickson, who you will meet again next week. Rock Cheers, and roll. Bro. Have a safe weekend. Thank you.